Abiogenesis. The fourth and last part. This sound file contains the spoken version of a Wikipedia article on Abiogenesis. You are listening to the fourth and last part. The fourth and last part begins now. Abiogenesis. From Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at en.wikipedia.org. Section 5. Other Models. Autocatalysis. In 1993, Stuart Kaufman proposed that life initially arose as autocatalytic chemical networks. Autocatalysts are substances that catalyze the production of themselves and therefore have the property of being a simple replicator. In his book, The Selfish Gene, biologist Richard Dawkins cites experiments performed by the chemist Julius Rebeck and his colleagues at the Scripps Research Institute in California that demonstrated the possibility that autocatalysts could exhibit competition within a population of entities with heredity, which could be interpreted as a rudimentary form of natural selection. Clay Hypothesis A model for the origin of life based on clay was forwarded by A. Graham Carnes Smith of the University of Glasgow in 1985, and explored as a plausible illustration by several scientists. The clay hypothesis postulates that complex organic molecules arose gradually on a pre-existing non-organic replication platform, in this case, silicate crystals in solution. Complexity in companion molecules developed as a function of selection pressures on types of clay crystal is then exapted, that is, the crystal shifts in the function of a trait during its evolution in order to serve the replication of organic molecules independently of their silicate launch stage. In 2007, chemist Bart Carr and colleagues reported their experiments to examine the idea that crystals can act as a source of transferable information. Mother crystals with imperfections were cleaved and used as seeds to grow daughter crystals from solution. They then examined the distribution of imperfections in the crystal system and found that the imperfections in the mother crystals were indeed reproduced in the daughters, but the daughter crystals had many additional imperfections. For gene-like behavior to be observed, the quantity of inheritance of these perfections should have exceeded that of the mutations in the successive generations, and it did not. Thus, Carr concludes that crystals, quote, were not faithful enough to store and transfer information from one generation to the next, end quote. Gold's Deep Hot Biosphere Model In the 1970s, the astrophysicist Thomas Gold proposed the theory that life first developed not on the surface of the Earth, but several kilometers below the surface. The discovery in the late 1990s of nanobes, filamental structures that are smaller than bacteria but that may contain DNA, in deep rocks might be seen as lending support to Gold's theory. It is now reasonably well established that microbial life is plentiful at shallow depths in the Earth up to 5 kilometers, or 3.1 miles, below the surface in the form of extremophile archaea, rather than the better known eubacteria, which live in more accessible conditions. 
It is claimed that discovery of microbial life below the surface of another body in our solar system would lend significant credence to this theory. Thomas Gold also asserted that a trickle of food from a deep, unreachable source is needed for survival because life arising in a puddle of organic material is likely to consume all of its food and become extinct. Gold's theory is that flow of food is due to outgassing of primordial methane from the Earth's mantle. More conventional explanations of the food supply of deep microbes away from sedimentary carbon compounds is that the organisms subsist on hydrogen released by an interaction between water and reduced iron compounds in rocks. Primitive Extraterrestrial Life An alternative to earthly abiogenesis is the hypothesis that primitive life may have originally formed extraterrestrially, either in space or on Mars, a nearby planet. A supporter of this theory was Francis Crick. Organic compounds are relatively common in space, especially in the outer solar system where volatiles are not evaporated by solar heating. Comets are encrusted by outer layers of dark material, thought to be a tar-like substance composed of complex organic material formed from simple carbon compounds after reactions initiated mostly by irradiation by ultraviolet light. It is supposed that a rain of material from comets could have brought significant quantities of such complex organic materials to Earth. An alternative but related hypothesis proposed to explain the presence of life on Earth so soon after the planet had cooled down with apparently very little time for prebiotic evolution is that life formed first on early Mars. Due to its smaller size, Mars cooled before Earth, a difference of hundreds of millions of years, allowing prebiotic processes there while Earth was still too hot. Life was then transported to the cooled Earth when crustal material was blasted off Mars by asteroid and comet impacts. Mars continued to cool faster and eventually became hostile to the continued evolution or even existence of life. It lost its atmosphere due to low volcanism. Earth is following the same fate as Mars, but at a slower rate. The advantage of an extraterrestrial origin of primitive life is that life is not required to have evolved on each planet it occurs on, but rather in a single location and then spread about the galaxy to other star systems via cometary and or meteorite impact. Evidence to support the hypothesis is scant, but it finds support in recent study of Martian meteorites found in Antarctica and in studies of extremophile microbes. Additional support comes from a recent discovery of a bacterial ecosystem whose energy source is radioactivity. A 2001 experiment led by chemist Jason Dworkin subjected a frozen mixture of water, methanol, ammonia, and carbon monoxide to UV radiation, mimicking conditions found in an extraterrestrial environment. This combination yielded large amounts of organic material that self-organized to form bubbles, or micelles, when immersed in water. Dworkin considered these bubbles to resemble cell membranes that enclose and concentrate the chemistry of life, separating their interior from the outside world. The bubbles produced in these experiments were between 10 to 40 micrometers. 
which is thirty-nine ten thousandths to sixteen ten thousandths inches, or about the size of red blood cells. Remarkably, the bubbles fluoresced, absorbing UV and converting it into visible light in this way, was considered one possible way of providing energy to a primitive cell. If such bubbles played a role in the origin of life, the fluorescence could have been a precursor to primitive photosynthesis. Such fluorescence also provides the benefit of acting as a sunscreen, diffusing any damage that otherwise would be inflicted by UV radiation. Such a protective function such a protective function would have been vital for life on the early Earth, since the ozone layer, which blocks out the sun's most destructive UV rays, did not form until after photosynthetic life began to produce oxygen. Extraterrestrial Organic Molecules Another idea is that amino acids, which were formed extraterrestrially, arrived on Earth via comets. In 2009, it was announced by NASA that scientists had identified one of the fundamental chemical building blocks of life in a comet for the first time. Glycine, an amino acid, was detected in the material ejected from Comet Wild 2 in 2004 and collected by NASA's Stardust Probe. Tiny grains, just a few thousandths of a millimeter in size, were collected from the comet and returned to Earth in 2006 in a sealed capsule and distributed among the world's leading astrobiology labs. NASA said in a statement that it took some time for the investigating team, led by Dr. Jamie Elsila, to convince itself that the glycine signature found in Stardust's sample bay, was genuine and not just earthly contamination. Glycine has been detected in meteorites before, and there is also observations in interstellar gas clouds claimed for telescopes. But the Stardust find is described as a first in cometary material. Isotope analysis indicates that the late heavy bombardment included cometary impacts after the Earth coalesced, but before life evolved. Dr. Carl Pilcher, who leads NASA's Astrobiology Institute, commented that, quote, the discovery of glycine in a comet supports the idea that the fundamental building blocks of life are prevalent in space and strengthens the arguments that life in the universe may be common rather than rare." End quote. Recent observations suggest that the majority of organic compounds introduced on Earth by interstellar dust particles are considered principal agents in the formation of complex molecules thanks to their peculiar surface catalytic activities. Studies reported in 2008 based on isotopic ratios of organic compounds found in the Murchison meteorite, carbon-12 and carbon-13, suggested that the RNA component uracil and related molecules were formed extraterrestrially. On August 8, 2011, a report based on NASA studies with meteorites found on Earth was published suggesting DNA components, adenine, guanine, and related organic molecules, were made in outer space. More recently, scientists found that the cosmic dust permeating the universe contains complex organic matter that could be created naturally and rapidly by stars. Lipid World The Lipid World theory postulates that the first self-replicating object was 
lipid-like. It is known that phospholipids formed lipid bilayers in water while under agitation, the same structure as in cell membranes. These molecules were not present on early Earth. However, other amphiphilic long-chain molecules also form membranes. Furthermore, these bodies may expand by insertion of additional lipids, and under excessive expansion may undergo spontaneous splitting, which preserves at the same size and composition of lipids in the two progenies. The main idea in this theory is that the molecular composition of the lipid bodies is the preliminary way for information storage, and evolution led to the appearance of polymer entities such as RNA or DNA that may store information favorably. Studies on vesicles from potentially prebiotic amphiphiles have so far been limited to systems containing one or two types of amphiphiles. This is in contrast to the output of simulated prebiotic chemical reactions, which typically produce very heterogeneous mixtures of compounds. Within the hypothesis of a lipid bilayer membrane composed of a mixture of various distinct amphiphilic compounds, there is the opportunity of a huge number of theoretically possible combinations in the arrangements of these amphiphiles in the membrane. Among all these potential combinations, a specific local arrangement of the membrane world would have favored the constitution of a hypercycle, a positive feedback compared of two mutual catalysts represented by a membrane site and a specific compound trapped in the vesicle. Such site-slash-compound pairs are transmissible to the daughter vesicles, leading to the emergence of distinct lineages of vesicles, which would have allowed Darwinian natural selection. Polyphosphates the problem with most scenarios of abiogenesis is that the thermodynamic equilibrium of amino acids versus peptides is in the direction of separate amino acids. What has been missing is some force that drives polymerization. The resolution of this problem may well be in the properties of polyphosphates. Polyphosphates are formed by polymerization of ordinary monophosphate ions. Several mechanisms for such polymerization have been suggested. Polyphosphates cause polymerization of amino acids into peptides. They are also logical precursors in the synthesis of such key biochemical compounds as ATP. The key issue seems to be that calcium reacts with solid soluble phosphate to form an insoluble calcium phosphate. So some plausible mechanism must be found to keep calcium ions from causing precipitation of phosphate. There has been much work on this topic over the years. Meteorites may have introduced reactive phosphorus species early. There has been much work on this topic over the years, but an interesting new idea is that meteorites may have introduced reactive phosphorus species on the early Earth. Polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, the PAH, World Hypothesis Other sources of complex molecules have been postulated, including extraterrestrial stellar or interstellar origin. For example, from spectral analyses, organic molecules are known to be present in comets and meteorites. In 2004, 
the team detected traces of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAH, in a nebula. More recently, in 2010, another team also detected PAHs, along with fullerenes, or, quote, buckyballs, end quote, in nebulae. PAHs are the most complex molecules so far found in space. The use of PAHs has also been proposed as a precursor to the RNA world in the PAH world hypothesis. The Spitzer Space Telescope has recently detected a star, HH46-IR, which is forming by a process similar to that by which the Sun formed. In the disk of material surrounding the star, there is a very large range of molecules, including cyanide compounds, hydrocarbons, and carbon monoxide. PAHs have also been found all over the surface of galaxy M81, which is 12 million light years away from the Earth, confirming their widespread distribution on Earth. Multiple Genesis Different forms of life may have appeared quasi-simultaneously in the early history of Earth. The other forms may be extinct, leaving distinctive fossils through their different biochemistry, such as using arsenic instead of phosphorus, survive as extremophiles, or simply be unnoticed through their being analogous to organisms of the current life tree. The molecular biologist Hyman Hartman, for example, combines a number of theories together by proposing that, quote, the first organisms were self-replicating iron-rich clays, which fixed carbon dioxide into oxalic and other dicarboxylic acids. This system of replicating clays and their metabolic phenotype then evolved into the sulfide-rich region of the hot spring, acquiring the ability to fix nitrogen. Finally, phosphate was incorporated into the evolving system, which allowed the synthesis of nucleotides and phospholipids. If biosynthesis recapitulates bio biopsis, then the synthesis of amino acids preceded the synthesis of the purine and pyrimidine bases. Furthermore, the polymerization of the amino acid thioesters into polypeptides preceded the directed polymerization of amino acid esters by polynucleotides. End quote. Biologist Lynn Margulies' endosymbiotic theory suggests that multiple forms of archaea entered into symbiotic relationship to form the eukaryote cell. The horizontal transfer of genetic material between archaea promotes such symbiotic relationships, and thus many separate organisms may have contributed to building what has been recognized as the last universal common ancestor of modern organisms. James Lovelock's Gaia theory proposes that such symbiosis establishes the environment as a system produced by and supportive of life. We now come to the end of the last part, that is, part four of the spoken article, Abiogenesis. This sound file its text and all the text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 3.0 unported license, available at http colon slash slash creativecommons.org 
slash licenses slash vy hyphen sa slash 3.0.